could have our young people please come forward. And I am going to turn over the responsibilities of the kids' sermon for just a moment to Casey. All right, Casey, I called up his mom and asked if he had any of these, and I was expecting one or two. We got a bag full of this stuff. Uh, we're talking later in the gospel about the transfiguration. Go on. Or about, what are they called? Transformers. And so transformers is kind of the same idea as transfiguration, but I don't know anything about transformers. So Casey, where's, you know our, oh, is that our mic? What's what, is this going to freak you out if I put this on? You don't, you don't seem too shy. Okay, tell us about Transformers, because I don't know what Transformers uh, are. You can um, speak into, well, not speak. Um, you want me to you hold can that change them like that? this. It's real hard to change this one. And who is that? Optimus Prime. Optimus Prime, which I just found out this morning, is the boss Transformer. You guys know Transformers? No? Don't they have cartoons about these guys? Yes. Yes. Don't they have movies that are about Transformer guys too? Yes. And you've never seen any of that stuff? Wow. All right. You must be reading a lot. You're right. This does take a lot of work. I'm exhausted. So this Optimus Prime is a person, though, right? But he looks like a what? What did he look like? Be, well, what did he look like before you made him into this thing? Um, either a truck or a plane. A truck or a plane. All right. So you got like a helicopter here. What else we got in here? Ooh, that guy is ugly. <laughs> And you got a car. How about we do the car? Is the car the car you showed me was pretty easy. Can you hey, people at home, do you see our car? We got a car transformer here. Oh oh, mom knows transformers. <laughs> mom, fix Optimus 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 Optimus. Here, show me the car. So show everybody that's just a look a regular looking car. Okay, well they can't see, you gotta stand up, show them the car. So we've got a regular looking car, and now what happens to him? You, oh, and now he's a robot. And those robots fight, uh, hopefully they fight evil, right? This Not guy's the bad guy. Oh, well don't give me the bad guy, I don't want the bad guy. <laughs> Where, show me a good guy, where's a good guy? All right, so he's a helicopter. Okay, so you see our regular good guy helicopter. And then he transforms and he fights the bad guys, right? Yeah. And he wins, right? No, 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 all the time. All the time. <laughs> yeah, he always wins. All right. Well, thank you very much. Did, did Mom fix Optimus Prime? Optimus Prime is dead? Okay. All right. Well, I thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, what? That guy is a computer. He works on computers. Could you guess that? That's what he does for a living. He gets to work on computers every day. Well, thank you for telling us that Oc Optimus, Optimus. All right, so he's a real good guy. And thank you very much, Casey, for bringing those. The reason I asked him to bring those is because when we're talking about the transfiguration, I have no idea how to convey that to you guys. Um, we're going to hear in the gospel when you're in Sunday school that Jesus goes up on a mountain with three of his followers, and all of a sudden, the very human-looking Jesus comes the very God-looking Jesus. Um, and so that's why I wanted you to bring those transformers so that you can understand the transfiguration of Jesus looking normal like a car or a helicopter and then Jesus changing um, into something that you know we worship as up in heaven. And as Optimus Prime is, he is what we want to become like. He is all good and all perfect. We want to become like him. I don't know if you guys really sang that hymn that we just finished, um, but 
Peter wants to build uh, Jesus a, uh, a little shack, a little, a little shelter up there in the mountain. And Jesus is all, he's in all this glory, and they're saying, we're going to build you a shelter. And Jesus says, he turns the shelter down. And basically the idea was is that Peter wanted to build Jesus a shrine. And Jesus says, I, I don't want shrines. I want people. I want, to, I want to be among the people. I don't want shrines. I want people. And so that's why the main thing about church is not the building. It's the congregation of the people. And so Jesus, when he goes shortly, because uh, trans- this is going to lead us into Jerusalem, Jesus doesn't have much to do with the temple, the shrine, where they build big walls and hide God and protect God. Jesus is among the people. So the idea of the transfiguration is to tell us that God comes into our world as Jesus. And even though he looks like us, on the inside, when he's transfigured, you see that he is still God, and that he doesn't want to have any kind of shrines. He wants us, the people. And he's even going to go to the cross because he loves us, the people, more than he even loves himself. That's the message we're going to start hearing as of Ash Wednesday. So, Casey, thanks very much for bringing the Transformers with you today. Couldn't have done it without you. Thank you for your help as well. I appreciate that. Guys, enjoy your Sunday school. Now time to share our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns. And I'd like to begin with a uh, prayer. Um, I thought this uh, Friday and Saturday our confirmation retreat was an uplifting experience, hopefully for our young people. And I want to thank um, the uh, presenters and everyone else who came together, whether it was chaperones or drivers or whatever, uh, so that our young people from across the conference could come together um, to learn a little bit more about their faith and also how to prepare them uh, for confirmation. So that would be my first prayer, prayer of thanksgiving. Also, we have prayers for Betsy and Sandy Belden on the passing of Betsy's mother, who was Anne Charles. She died at the age of 102. And prayers for Anne as she passes from this life to her eternal one with Jesus in heaven. We continue to offer our prayers for Charlie Kellogg as he continues his recovery. Prayers for Sue Gilman, who is undergoing treatments for her cancer. Prayers for Glenn and Denise Wagner in their times of need and of healing. Prayers for Muriel Kilbovich recovering from her cancer treatments. Prayers for Lynn Omasta as she is treated for her cancer. Prayers for the health of Gene Sheehan as he deals with his cancer. And prayers for Bernie Lamprin as well. And prayers for Bill Parmeter. Uh, we hope to uh, be able to return to church real soon. And we continue to offer our prayers for Sarah, Sarah and Jimmy uh, Pigeon and also their two newborn twin girls as they continue to grow stronger day by day. Any other prayers that you would like to offer this morning? David Bell in our prayers, um, that, that has to be, I saw him just kind of turning and, you know, grimacing in pain, so I, I do hope that that can be dealt with. Yes. Prayers for Ruth for bone marrow transplant. Obviously, that goes well. Yes, that. And what was his first name? Okay, prayers for 28 years old. other prayers. Um, in the middle of our public worship, let us just kind of turn inward, um, say the things to Jesus we would not say out loud, and to listen for his whisper. Transforming spirit will awaken Jesus' disciples on the mountaintop, 
Awaken us here that we may discern the vision you place before us. We listen for what the word of God reveals to us. We dare to question our casual assumptions of religion in the hopes of better realizing who we are called to be as followers of Jesus Christ. The transfiguration revealed the hidden reality of Jesus. May we search out the hidden truth that is also at our center, that we may be made truly in the image and likeness of God our Creator. And may our time now together in prayer, and also alone in prayer, may these help us to see beyond all that is ordinary in the physical, may glimpse the mystery of your constant closeness to each and every one of us, especially in our times of most desperate need. May we now join together in reciting the prayer that Jesus himself gave to all of us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. How much the church could accomplish with greater resources. How our shared ministry could blossom if our thanksgiving to God reflected the truth of our eternal lives and not only our physical ones. We have taken a step toward the mountaintop of Christ's transfiguration by coming here this morning because we realize that we too are spiritual beings, so much more than just our bodies. So let us now be open to Jesus' transformative giving so that what we give truly benefits us with even greater rewards. So let us be as generous as our faith calls us to be. Is God from whom all blessings flow? Loving God, we offer you our thanks for these people and their generosity. We hope that these gifts placed in your sanctuary can become a symbol of our love for you and for all others. And as we will hear in the gospel about the transfiguration, that Jesus was so much more than he appeared to be. May we as this church, this people, and also as these offerings, be so much more than they may appear to be. Work your wonders through whatever we give to you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, may we now turn to our red hymnal, uh, number 287, Here, O My Lord. Good morning. Today's uh, scripture is Exodus 34, 29 through 35, page 71 in the Pew Bibles, if you'd like to follow along. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke with them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord has spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him.
And our gospel for today is taken from Luke's gospel, chapter 9, verses 28 through 43. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzlingly white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to Jesus. They appeared in glory and were speaking at his de- of his departure, which was about to be accomplished at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw this glory in the two men who stood with Jesus. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he had said. And while he was saying this, a cloud came over and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered into the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly, a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And while he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. So we've just heard the absolutely amazing account of the Transfiguration. It begins with a rather mundane fact. It says that something happened eight days earlier. So, I mean, you're all the way literally up into the heavens, and we get this little phrase that sets it all apart by saying, eight days earlier. And, you know, that that seems kind of weird. It's just not the way that, you know, Luke usually writes his material. And that something that was eight days earlier was the exact opposite of the glory of Jesus in heaven. It was Jesus' prediction that he would suffer and that he would die and resurrect when they finally did arrive in Jerusalem. Like I said, most of Luke's stories, they don't have this connector of anything, like, you know, eight days earlier. So we have here an intentional linkage between Jesus' I'm going to die and also Jesus' transfiguration. We just have to figure out the why. So in the story about I'm going to die, Jesus' last statement is, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. I think they were imagining, you know, the God coming in all the glory and changing the whole entire world, not maybe a more specific idea that it can be in Jesus. And so then the first statement of the Transfiguration is that Jesus takes Peter and James and John with him up on some mountain, and there, these these three disciples, they see Jesus' divinity. His appearance changes. They They essentially are looking at the kingdom of God because Jesus is the kingdom of God, and now they're looking at him not as a human, but as the Son of God. So today is the last Sunday of the Epiphany season. This has been a time to consider the mystery of God's human nature in Jesus. But Jesus' humanity never, ever, ever erases Jesus' divinity. We talk in in around the end of the Lenten season from Philippians that Jesus empties himself of his divinity because he he has his fullness of his human nature and the two of them don't compete against each other but the two of them never erase each other either. The great mystery of the incarnation, something that we really can't understand all that well, is that for all of Jesus' obvious and visible and real human nature, that unseen divine nature walks with Jesus wherever he walks, talks whenever Jesus speaks. It is part of them. They can never be separated, not before, not now, not up in heaven. So Peter, John, and James, they've come to know Jesus, this carpenter from Nazareth. They've come to know that he is a gifted teacher. They've even come to know him as a wonder worker. They've even come to realize and call him the Messiah, the one sent by God to save his people. But none of those expectations ever thought that Jesus on the inside was God himself on earth. 
So none of, it was pre- none of them were prepared when they saw the transfiguration, when for lack of a better phrase, and that's why I asked Casey to bring those transformers, Jesus is turned inside out, and now the divinity is apparent, and the human nature recedes for a moment. The transfigured Jesus appears in the company of Moses and Elijah, and these two represent the law and the prophets. They symbolize everything that God had revealed that is going to culminate in the life and the ministry of Jesus. And they're all up there in the mountain. Moses, the giver of the law, who said, God will send another prophet like me. And then you got Elijah, the one who was swooped up by a a fiery chariot and taken up into the sky. And the last words of the last page of the Old Testament say, before Jesus comes, Elijah will return. Now you've got Moses and Elijah, and Jesus is transfigured into something that is almost unrecognizable. And it must have been absolutely amazing. They were visioning this kingdom of God right before them. And the both of them are standing there with this transfigured Jesus on the mountaintop. And this represents the fullness of everything God had to say up until the moment of Jesus. And it, they're all there to testify that Jesus is about to come to the culmination, the fulfillment of his new covenant with us. And the three disciples, it says in the Bible, they don't know if they're asleep, they don't know if they're awake. Just imagine yourself, you know, all of a sudden somebody turns into light. And all of a sudden these two other dead people appear and they're kind of floating around. Would you think you were dreaming? Would you think you're insane? What would you, how would you process that? We can't, you know, just automatically assume that these guys are just faithful people and automatically they know exactly what we think after 2,000 years. They had to be stunned out of their minds. Were they dreaming? Were they awake? What's taking place around me? They can't process what they're witnessing. But as it all draws to a close and all of this mystery is about to return, Peter wants to hang on doesn't want to let it go. He wants to stay there in heaven. You ever hear any of these stories about near-death experiences? Some of these times, these people, when they go to get this little glimpse of heaven before their time and they come back, a lot of times they don't want to come back. They come back because there's someone that they love here. They get this message that you need to go back. But there is this idea that I don't want to leave that. And Peter is doing that. I don't want to leave this heavenly existence. He doesn't want it to end. Moses and Elijah speak to Jesus in what Luke says is Jesus' departure. What a simple sounding word, but that departure means all of this. That means that whole Lenten journey that we're going to start on Wednesday. They're helping Jesus to get ready for the next act, the final act. Peter doesn't want to go on that road. He doesn't want to go there. He wants to skip there and stay in heaven. He doesn't know what to say. He doesn't know how to slow all of this down. That never, ever stopped Peter from saying something. He was always one who would speak first and then think about it later. And he blurts out something. you got three heavenly beings kind of just floating there in light. And Peter says, well, let me build you a tent. Let me build you some kind of a little structure here. And, you know, just wants to hold on to the moment. He wants to make it last. Peter doesn't want it to end. And who really can blame him? He's looking into heaven doesn't want to return to the hard work of ministry. He doesn't want to think about what Jesus' departure is going to mean for him and that little group that has become so close to him. He doesn't want to think what it means to Jesus. He wants to forget all about Jesus' predictions eight days earlier of what's going to happen in Jerusalem. He wants to stay in heaven like that hymn we had. He wants to build a shrine. He wants to keep Jesus there. He wants to stay in the shrine Jesus says, I can't stay in the shrine. I have things to do. But who can blame Peter? Who of us, you know, sitting here with a a winter storm coming down upon us, you know, you go away to vacation. There are people flying back today from Florida or from, you know, down in the Caribbean somewhere. They're flying in. They're going to walk through an absolutely frigid airport parking lot tonight to go to work tomorrow in a snowstorm. How much those people, how many of those people want to stay down there in Florida and not come back to have to go to work on Monday? Peter wants to stay up in heaven. And it makes complete, absolute sense. Even Jesus shows signs of his slow return to this world and to the work that he has after the transfiguration. They've no sooner come down the mountain. And Luke says for some reason it's the next day. I just imagine that Jesus and the, and the disciples are exhausted. They have to, they come out of this experience like, like, like Glenda and I were talking about. We went home last night after the confirmation retreat because we didn't sleep all that well. We just collapsed at 8 o'clock at night. I imagine that Jesus and the disciples just collapsed on the top of that mountain. The next day, 
they finally have enough energy to come down. They are spent. And as soon as they come down the mountain, a man yells at Jesus that he has to help his desperately ill son because his disciples cannot. Jesus has just left the experience of heaven and is immediately confronted with a child who shrieks, convulses, foams at the mouth, and mauls himself. And then biblical scholars, they debate about who Jesus is talking to. He doesn't know if it's the crowds, they don't know if it's the disciples, but Jesus' frustration is clearly evident. Jesus says, how much longer must I be with you? How much longer must I bear with you? 2,000 years, we're still trying to be a little bit more like Jesus, like our own Optimus Prime. And we're still failing all the time. And Jesus, I wonder if he ever up in heaven says, just how much longer before you guys get it? And I give Luke credit for keeping that line in his story. This is as honest a picture of Jesus as it was of Peter wanting to stay up on that mountain. And it's not completely flattering, but it is completely honest. Jesus is exhausted to the core. He is spiritually exhausted. He is physically exhausted. He is running on fumes. He has little more to give of himself, and yet the hardest part of his ministry still lies ahead of him. And for a moment, at least, Jesus bent is into his frustration, even his fears. How much longer do I have to do this? This is the real human side of Jesus returning to the front. I imagine Jesus is remembering that mountaintop. The reality check is now that the father is yelling at him, you have to take care of my son. And Jesus is going to have to dig down deep and find some way to find compassion. And he does almost immediately. But for that one moment, he gives way to his humanity and says, how much longer then the compassion of Jesus comes right back to the surface and says, I'll take care of him. No one is going to do the same to Jesus in just a few days' time. So back to that question of why the, the crucifixion is tied with the transfiguration. It's to let us know that not only Jesus, the man, goes to the cross, but we're talking about God going with Jesus. The transfiguration reminds us that Jesus is the Son of God, and that when he leaves that mountain to continue on to Jerusalem and go to the cross, God goes to the cross. God knows what it is to suffer. God knows what it is to face the blackness of death. So no matter how bad or terrible your lives may have been, don't blame God for not doing anything. God gave himself so he would know exactly what it means to suffer if you've got cancer, if you've lost a loved one, if you are dying, if, you, if someone you know dies, Jesus knows what that is. And God knows what that is wanted to stay up on the mountain but they came down to do the work of the ministry for us so I don't care how often we take that path of Lent there's always something new and more important to think about and also to pray about when we have this kind of a God so that's why we approach just three days hence Ash Wednesday and Lent don't just let it pass by as we rush into spring or rush to get to Easter you know, trying to get and stay up in heaven, we got to figure out what that means first. That's going to take at least 40 days. So do it whatever, however you want to do it. Figure out how we're going to figure out what that means for the love of God for each and every one of us. That we can continue. Now we know Jesus is up there. We know that we can be transformed inside. Well, we got to come back down. we got to do the work of this world. We have to continue the ministry of this life that that doesn't become meaningless and then the resurrection just becomes a fable. We have to go through that to get to Easter. That's why we talk about the transfiguration right before we get to Lent. So let us now prepare ourselves to also see the transfigured Jesus in obvious physical manifestations of bread and wine but to be able to see also through the physical to see the divine gift that Jesus will be present among us as we gather at that table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.